I'm going to leave the projector on because Raj is going to show you uh, a little bit how to do homework 5A. That's easy. When is it due? 30 seconds. That's soon, right? Like uh, pretty soon? Tuesday. Right. So <laughs> the, the guys don't have that much time to go. Although, if you do demos after and the demos work, we call it good anyway. So uh, we have a plan. The big ticket item for us, it's LDA. No, no. Let's remove those guys. LDA. How do? That's gonna take more than up to next week. Okay. So that, that's that's our big project uh, until we end up with like uh, last piece, last homework. That's easy. So that's homework 5A and 5B. But for 5A in particular, uh, we have uh, text summarization. With or without LDA. I think the problem is asking you to do it with or without LDA. And um, just to recap a little bit of what LDA produces, the result, uh, it's a matrix of, so we have here, let's say, and documents, and this is K topics. So each document becomes a distribution of our topics. And we have here the K topics into the vocabulary. So this is K topics. And this is the vocabulary V. Now, we, we're not doing a dot product here. What we are doing in LDA is to say every document is a distribution over topics. So that will be, we, we can call this matrix, uh, I think I call it in the, in the code that I, in, in the pseudo code that I give A. So A document D, A1, AD2, up to ADK, that is this, this, this line here for document D. And every topic, we're going to call that a fee. We will call this B. It's a distribution over words. So let's call that B some particular 1, B, 2, up to B, W, the last word. <laughs> So for Formwork 5A, we're not concerned yet how to get these matrices. MATLAB or Python or Java will get it for us. So, but you should know what you are getting out of this LDA, right? So you call LDA, typically you call it over the entire collection at once. So you have all the documents, uh, you can do the DUC data set, you can do the 20 news group data set. So you have documents into words. So think about it, the, the original matrix is documents into words. That's what we have. And then via LDA, you get those two matrices. Documents represented as distribution over K things. And each one of the K things or topics represented as distribution over words. We have a lot of work to do theoretically and practically how to get those. That's homework 5B. But for homework 5A, I'm going to give you a script, and Raj is going to demo how do you actually run it. I'm asking you to do text summarization without LDA or with LDA. So how does that go? Well, um, so first of all, step number one is uh, to, for each document, extract sentences. So each, uh, each document becomes a sentence in document one, sentence in that document two, sentence in that document T or something. Right? So we, we segment, segmentation of the document means we chop it into sentences. I do not expect you program that. I expect you call a library and it gives you the sentences out. But you could go for the certain punctuation and whatnot and break the sentences yourselves. Right? And then um, 
I have to choose either the bag of words, no LDA, versus LDA. So if I do it, uh, that second step, which way, which way does it go? Bag of words means every document is a set of word counts. That's what I have here in this matrix, right? Every document for every word, I know the counts. Then for each document D, I set PD is the distribution of document into words. <coughs> now, uh, in here, PD might be the distribution of document into, into topics. That's the point of using LDA. If I use LDA, that's a big difference because if D is a distribution over words, it's over 50,000 or 100,000 words, most of them being zero or very close to zero. You usually want to do some smoothing to not get crystal zeros because that's a bad. But in here, distribution over topics, if you have 100 topics, it may be a distribution over 100 things. Now you may try 200 or 300 topics, but still, 300 is much less than 50,000, right? That's fixed, so PD doesn't change. Um, and then I say um, greedily, uh, so I start with a summary, which is an empty set. Greedily choose next sentence. Uh, let's call it small s, like that, uh, let's call it t. Um, when I compute this P, P, S, is going to be the distribution. So first of all, I have to update the summary. Summary is the summary with that sentence, next sentence. So I'm choosing the next sentence to add to my summary. I recompute P, S, which is a distribution over words. But in here again, P, P, S will be a distribution of S into topics. So if I go with topics, I'll have to make both S and D into topics. If I go with words, I'll just keep the distribution over words. And I measure the KL distance uh, between, so I want to minimize the KL distance between, I believe it's PD with PS. <coughs> Same thing here. There's versions of that. If people want to use the mutual information, that's fine with me. Or. So I, I know this, uh, I think Raj noticed that, that people found it easier to call in Python a mutual information. Is it identical with kill distance? No. But we're not going to worry about statistical detail right now. We want, we, because the way I think about this, we want a proxy for getting PD and PS close to each other. That's that we're using this uh, KL or mutual information as a proxy for are those things close enough. So now the, the difference between this and other functions is what's the best proxy for that. I'm not too concerned about that because uh, I use it as a black box. You're not going to implement it, you're going to call a function. I'm more interested in, in the ability to run PD and PS as distribution over either words or topics, and then choose the next sentence that will minimize or maximize my objective here. So you have to think of PD as a fixed thing, it doesn't change, and of PS as something that with every sentence I get the bigger summary. <coughs> and my job is to get the summary as close as possible to the document. The summary's length is fixed, so we, we have essentially a, a fixed amount of precision, if you like. We're going up to 50 lines, or up to five sentences, or up to a page, or something. So we only measure 
within that space, everybody will have the same exact uh, dimension of the summary, say half a page. And then within that half a page, how close can you get PS to PD? That's the task. Does it make sense? So PD is fixed either in words or in topics. PS advances with every sentence, again, either words or topics, whatever you, you have to do it both in words and in topics. And um, we don't need to know right now how LDA produces the topics, but we need to know how to use them. Right? For example, how are you gonna, once you collect the third sentence, how are you getting PS as a distribution over topics? If you have already the matrices. So the question is, if I have a new document or sentence or whatever S is, I need to pass it through the LDA to obtain S as a distribution over topics. So those libraries, I think, have a call, apart from the training call, which is says training, give me the two matrices, there's a different call that says if you have a new piece of text, you'll pass it through the existing model and will give you the probability distribution over the topics. Hands up who's with me. Who, 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 who is into the master plan here? So there's two things. One is how to use LDA, and I'm choosing this not because it's the best uh, downstream necessity, but because I want to show you summarization, and I want to show you an application of LDA, so we marry those things together, say here's a package. But then the second thing is how to obtain the LDA matrices. That's a very conceptually difficult, mathematically intensive part. It includes sampling, it includes prob probabilities, all kinds of multinomial distributions. But for this, we don't need to know that. Just get the matrices, run it. Either. So you have to come up with this structure of the code yourself, managing those sentences, managing the summaries. And we do this for every document. The last step is, so once you've done the whole thing, evaluation, per doc, we run rouge between the summary that we get and the D golden summary. So at least the DUC data set comes with every document, comes with a pre-established summary. So we can run my summary, the one I'm producing there, against the given summary, and Rouge will give me a number. I do that for every document, and at the end I can average over all the documents to get the number. We're not, I think the TAs will put up some numbers that you need to get, but we're not concerned about that. They're like, how, what's your Rouge accuracy? And we're much more concerned with did you understand how this structure with adding the next sentence, recompute the distribution, pass it through the KL distance or mutual information? And obviously this will be a little trial here, right? I have to try a bunch of sentences, compute the KL distance for them, settle upon the one that I choose. That's a greedy process, so once I pick a sentence in, I'm not changing my mind. That's gonna stay in there. I move to the next one, up to where the summary becomes, I don't know, whatever the, the size of the summary is. It is a very practical, Thing, they'll give you a, a size of the summary. I need a paragraph of, of at most, I don't know, 200 words, at most six lines, at most half a page. So usually when you do extractive summarization, you have a fixed amount of space, just a matter how, how well can you do in that space. Okay? So let's have it. Raj is gonna show you some code. Half of it is his, half of it is from previous students. Uh, Something like that. You need a dongle here? Mm -hmm. you think? Yes. What do you have? Uh, everything. The HDMI cable is If you have HDMI, just plug this in. explained we are supposed to do one is with LDA and one is without LDA 
So like Professor explained, let me explain you first this one, how we are supposed to do this. So this is the code which I have done on 20 NG data set. So let's assume you have uh, 20 NG and there are multiple uh, documents in there, right? So let's say we are uh, uh, going over every document. So here, the first thing which you guys can see here is the LDA model. Uh, here you guys can use the library. Like Professor explained, the mathematical part is a little bit intensive. You might do it in the homework 5B. But for this homework, you guys can actually like create a function which actually calls the LDA. So the main important thing here which you guys have to remember is to create uh, the PD, that is the topic distribution over the document. So this LDA which you get, that you this will be applied to first to the document that you are receiving from the 20 ng data set so let's say you are uh, taking a single uh, document which has some sentences inside it so first of all this lda will actually fit in and transform that document so you might get a topic distribution over that specific document so it will be a distribution of topics over that specific thing based on number of topics like uh, like uh, this is like a hyperparameter, you can keep it how much ever you want. So that's what we do here. Coming to the KL divergence, this is another function, you guys can write it as a function or do whatever you guys like to. But this basically helps you to measure the probability distribution between the two things which you might get. So one is PD and one is PS. So you have to find PS, which is similar to the topic distribution that is PD. When what is this PS? Let me just go over through this. So here you can see, uh, you can use TF-IDF or, or let's say count vectorizer, any of those just to pre-process stuff of, of, for your 20 NG data set, convert them into some kind of embeddings kind of stuff. So this entire thing here will do the transformation of the document. This is the most important part. This is where you are calculating or performing the LDA which will give you the PD, that is the topic distribution over the specific document that you guys take. Uh, yes? Yeah. Too small. Huh? Too small. Too small? <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see if I can. Nope. Uh, okay, maybe I'll zoom it so it's not working here. You might have to go to options. Should it work? No, so, so, so. Control is not working, this is not working. The last option is to take a snippet. Yeah, maybe. Okay, let's do that. Is it visible now? Little better. Little better. Okay, any, anyway, just understand the concept that it's, it's easy to perform. You don't have to look at the code, just to, it's just for reference. So, here, so first, let's say you calculated the topic distribution of, over the document, which is the PD that you guys get. Now comes the important part about calculating the PS. So, a PS, like Professor said, it's 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 the summary or the sentences that you get that will most describe in the best way what is that document trying to speak so basically you have to get the sentences we are doing extract to summarization here right extract to summarization means you have to pick up the sentences from that document that will best explain you the summary that's what we are supposed to do so just to give you a hint what we are going to do here is let's say we do like the pre-processing you guys know this nltk.sentence tokenization this will actually segregate the entire document into sentences and that and that that's where we look up to every specific sentence and then we do the lda so what we'll do is let's say we uh, carry out sentence tokenization we get the first sentence now that first sentence we will do the lda over the topic distribution which we have already trained it on so document so first LDA that you guys have here let me just show you oops hmm. so like I said this function which you have called it was already trained on the document right you calculated the PD through this right now for PS 
you are going to use this same trained model, the same distribution, but over that specific sentence only. So what will happen is you will apply LDA, that is distribution over topic, but on that specific sentence. Does it make sense? So what will happen is this specific sentence will be compared to the topic distribution that you guys have. Let's say you're actually comparing the summary and I mean the topic distribution and the topic distribution of this specific sentence. And you are trying to see are they similar or not. So this KL divergence or the KL, uh, the, the mutual information score will help you to tell or identify how much close this sentence is similar or how much, how well this specific sentence describes that topic. So we start from the, uh, let's say MP sentence, that's how you proceed, right? Let's say you don't have anything uh, first and then you go over first sentence. You calculate the topic distribution. Let's say you got a specific answer. Uh, this is the specific score, let's say five or 0 0.5. Now you go to the next sentence. Try to calculate the KL divergence score again. If that sentence describes the summary better than the previous sentence that you guys have, you will replace that. Means that means this specific sentence is telling you more about the summary. Like it, it is more good enough as compared to that sentence that tells you about the topic that you are you guys want to summarize. Does it make sense? So so it's it's just a simple process. You just have to do the same thing. So here you guys can see the, there is a let's say this is a uh, sentence number. This is where you tokenize sentence the document now we this is just some steps to actually you can create an array or whatever you guys want and basically add your sentences up there and try to figure out okay if this sentence is good enough if this sentence is good enough or not this is the topic distribution for the sentence like i explained you are using the trained model that you guys have used here which is for the topic the same thing you will apply for this specific sentence so you will get the PS, that is probability distribution of the summaries over that topics. And then, let me just create a new snip. So then, like I said, this is a KL score. So what you're doing is just KL divergence between the topic distribution that you guys had over the entire document that will be compared to the topic distribution for that specific sentence only. So you just loop over every sentence, try to figure out if this sentence is better, this sentence is better, this sentence is better. This is where you are doing the entire process. Just see uh, to like uh, if the KL score is greater than the current best score, replace that. Add this sentence as a current best sentence. Try to uh, increment this by one, and then at the final, just uh, append this into a, some kind of a summary or an array that you guys can create. Just to give you a hint, let me see. I I have the uh, yes here. So. Let's say this uh, th this was the first document in 20 ng Let's say I was wondering if anyone and blah, blah, everything. This is the entire document. So for this document, when you create this entire process, you might get a summary, which is just maybe two lines or three lines or four lines, depending on how much lines you want. You can like add that. Like let's say I just want two, two sentences. So you just shift off, like let's say first sentence, second sentence. Then let's say you calculate the KL divergence for the third sentence. Then you see, okay, is the KL divergence for this sentence better than the previous two? If yes, replace the third sentence with the first one. Then again, repeat the same process. Does it make sense? Awesome. So, yes, so that's it. That's for summary number for the first. I, I just uh, like created a break here. So just to uh, give you guys the first two summaries and try to answer your questions if you guys have any. And in the same manner, you just loop over the entire document, do these things and get the summaries. Any, any any doubts here regarding this is this is with LDA okay so you guys have to do this with LDA and the other one which I'm going to show is without LDA so this is clear cool so the only thing is I, I think yeah 
maybe for the first sentence you compute the KL distance between the document and the sentence, but once I add the second sentence and the third sentence, once I have more sentences, my understanding of all this is that we want to compute the KL distance between the document and the whole summary, not just the last sentence. So as, as we keep going with it and say, okay, I have three sentences, that's done, I'm adding the fourth one. The fourth one could be a bunch of candidates. Yeah, yeah. So you're for each fourth you're sentence, I'm appending yes. it, and then I'm saying the PS has to be the distribution yeah. not only over the last sentence, but the whole summary so far. Right. That's the first three sentences plus right. the fourth one. Right. Because right. we don't want to pick the sentence that's the closest necessarily to the document. We want to pick the sentence that makes the summary overall as close as possible to the document. So if the document talks about Virgil, but I already have three sentences talking about Virgil, the fourth one necessarily is not one about Virgil. Maybe it's about some other thing in the document that I don't have yet in the summary, right? I'm not, I'm not sure how that reflects to his code. We'll work this out. But conceptually, we want the whole summary to get closer to the document, not necessarily right. the last sentence. Yes, yes. And so so the, the last sentence will be appended to the second one, and then you will uh, get the comparison. Like Sir said, it, it is like a cumul like you can see you know, the cumulative sentences this cumulative sentences means the first sentence, if the second sentence is good enough, you com you get it, you like merge them together, like first sentence, then the second sentence. Then again, for the third sentence, you check whether this word is better than the previous two sentences. If yes, then again, you remove the first, append it to the second sentence, and then try to see. Um, but we are checking for the whole summary, right? Not for each sentence. Huh? Uh, the KL distance. Mm -hmm. We are checking for the whole summary after we are adding the sentence, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So when we decide that the KL distance is less and I want to replace a sentence, how do we decide which sentence to replace in the previous summary? So you might, you might, you will have a score for every. So you are starting from the null, right? Yeah. So you will append first sentence. Yeah. And at the first. Yeah. So we we are replacing sentences. If but I there the would be a limit to the number yeah. of sentences in the summary, right? You're right. So yeah, I've already have three sentences. Yeah. I'm just trying for the fourth one. Yeah, and I'm trying it turns out to be better. The case all sentences is. that are not the first three. I'm trying one by one. Hmm. I add three that I have plus the candidate one. Hmm. I have the summary. I run the kill distance. And I see out of all possible candidates, which sentence gives me the closest, the best scale distance. So you mean we replace each no. three and check which case? I whether? keep the three okay. and I add the fourth one. Okay. But that fourth one I add it multiple times. I try so different candidates for the fourth one. Right? right. But let's say our limit is only three. No, no, so no. How do we when I reach the limit, I stop. Okay. So even if we don't find the best solution, we stop. Like if right. Your summary may not be optimally the best because you're doing greedily. You yeah. never go back to replace something okay. in the past. Okay. The moment you reach the number of characters or the number of sentences or whatever the limit is, you die. Okay. Yep. Okay. Huh? Right. So, so as long as the KL distance reduces, we choose the candidate. You're saying? No, no. The KL distance uh, will not necessarily reduce. In principle, should reduce, but you don't you don't worry about reducing. What you worry about is you always have the sentence if you have space in the summary. Okay. You don't want to quit early. If you have space for two more sentences, you keep going. Which sentence you pick next is the one that overall that sentence plus the what you had before gives you the closest so summary so to the document. So, Professor, this code is the, the, the replacing one. Like, it replaces the first sentence. If that's not better, then it accumulates the other two sentences. And based on that, it adjusts the KL score and gives you the summary. So, we'll have to see exactly how this so maybe I'll I, I didn't look at the code. But the intention is to get the summary overall as close to the document, not the last sentence. Cool. So, this is with LDA, the, now this this one is without LDA, so this one is very simple. It just, you calculate the uh, distribution of count over that specific document. So let's say you have a document, you just calculate the PD. Here is the count distribution that Professor explained here. The distribution of words over specific document. So that is the count. You can use any vectorizer if, if you want or just count it manually if you can. So that will just give you the distribution of the count over that specific document. And here, the PS is the same thing, same process, but here just you have to calculate the count. That's it. Like this sentence has this many counts of that specific uh, so words. So let's say this is the entire document. You segregate them into words. Every word has a count. 
this many this word is occurred this many times or this many word is occurred this many times that is the count distribution that you get of that specific document so the ps will be the same thing but just the distribution of count of that specific sentence so same thing same process just the distribution of count and the instead of uh, kl divergence you can also use the mutual information score that you guys have a, li a library you can call it that will give you the answer and then just the like professor said the same thing just uh, uh, try to get the best summary based on the number of sentences that you guys want so same thing same process that's it any any doubts in this so can we see a little bit that uh, the the mm -hmm. the duc data set oh, the so summary there's a folder summary. yes i just i just i so for duc i have not run the code here on my laptop but it's the same thing but just uh, for you guys to understand the rule score what you guys have to do for that so this is an abstract every document in this summary for the duc data set might have an abstract which is the golden summary golden summary in the sense that is what you compare your summaries that you guys got through lda topic distribution and everything and that summary will be compared with the golden summary that you guys have so this so, is a misleading a little bit exactly. naming because it says summaries but every file contains the summary it's called abstract hmm. but then it contains the document so if you're not careful there's multiple ways to mess this up really bad for example read the whole thing as the summary which is the summary plus the document or read the whole thing as the document which is the document plus the summary so you have to there's the documents are also written separately but if you only read those files in the summaries, you have to take the abstract part as the golden evaluation, leave it for the side, that's only in Rouge. We're not using the abstract anywhere else than in the evaluation. And the rest of it is the document, which you can pass through LDA, get the summaries out of it, and do everything with it. So if you read it from these files that are in the subfolder called summaries, there will be the summary at the top, that's a golden summary which it's only used for evaluation, and the rest of the document. If you read it from the document folders, you'll see the documents, but not the summaries. That's it. So it's the same process, just loop, or you can do, do the basic Python code starts with that. Uh, yeah. For the assignment, like, as soon as we, like, you said this, as soon as you get, like, the first summary, you stop. So we just get the root score of that. Like, we don't have to optimize it or anything. Like, try it again if the score is very low. Also. No, that's up to you. But we want you to do it for every document. So once you have a pipeline, you run it for every document, and you compute an average. I think they can post some expected average, but that's not critical for this homework. If you don't get that average, it's not like we're going to worry too much about it. What we worry about is the managing of PS distribution. All right. Yep. So, uh, thank you, Raj. I think we need to work a little bit on the code. Maybe yes, we I need to make that. sure yes. that the kill distance is computing between PD and the cumulative PS. That is right. the existing S plus the new candidate sentence. It's like in decision tree and trying a split. I'm trying multiple splits. What I have so far is what I have so far. I'm not changing my mind about that. But as a, as the next split, I'm trying it out. Okay. So then, uh, uh, before I move on, one more uh, word of caution. This part in here can be very messy for multiple reasons. Keep in mind that if you go over words, you may end up with distributions over 50, 60,000 things. I think 20 news groups might have 29,000 words in it, most of them being zero. If you get any particular document, you saw a document, it's a half a page, out of 29 words, how many of them appear in that document? Very, very few. So you have to imagine the whole data structure that you use or the process where you have a race of 29,000 locations, most of them being zero. How do you deal with that? Right, so that's one thing. Secondly, when you compute whatever metric, so we're not insisting on KL versus mutual information because it's a proxy anyway. It may be useful to, to check the implementation for things like, what if there are zeros in there? Is it gonna give me an error? Is it gonna give me a, a random output? Is it gonna give me something reasonable if I put zeros? And if it is, how do I fix it? Typically, people do something called smoothing, where they replace the zero with something very small, like a 0 0.00001 
to not end up with probabilities that are crystal zeros. Secondly, what we can check here, so in theory, this works to have zeros for one of them if the other one has zeros in the same places. But again, this has to be carefully checked in order to not get weird answers. Another thing to check in those metrics is if you can pass the distributions unnormalized. It's very easy to implement KL distance mutual information with distributions that have not been divided by their total. If you implement it yourself or you use a library that does that, it computes the correct numbers, even though the vectors passed in are vectors of counts, you can just pass the counts directly. Right? You don't have to normalize and just pass the counts. That may be particularly useful for S, because in S, every time I'm adding a sentence, I'm adding a few counts of words to the current ones. Right? So I'm just updating the counts. I don't have to normalize it. I just pass it through, and the kill distance does the right job. So this is one of the reasons for which topics will work much better if we have appropriate number of topics and appropriate probabilities in between. Because we have a much more reasonable space to deal with, right? Conceptually, semantically speaking, we don't expect the meaning of the document to be represented in 29,000 dimensions. If I obtain 150 topics, say, I expect most of the documents in terms of meaning to be properly described as weightage over those topics. So 150, 200 seems enough numbers to indicate documents are about that, or about that, or about that, or about that, in a data set like 20 news groups. It doesn't look like I need 29,000 things to make that difference. So that's gonna require a little bit of correct planning, as in how do I add my sentence to S and how do I recompute the distribution, but also a lot of back and forth with the data structures you have will give you a bunch of errors and then you have to sort them out. Just one question, it might not be very relevant, but in his implementation he was removing uh, the sentence if it's not re really relevant, right? So does that make it dynamic? How do you know it's relevant or not? I mean, uh, in his implementation, in uh, Radha's implementation, I don't really know how he was removing the sentence, but he said that the implementation removes the sentence. So. Assuming that we have an algorithm that um, removes a sentence and replaces it with something else. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, I, I think you can add things like that. We don't mind. I, I think uh, what I would worry about, for example, removing all the stop words in the document and in sentences everywhere because stop words are no content. So whatever distribution of a stop words you get, it's not indicative of any meaning. So you can just remove the stop words. That's reasonable. My, my replacement was just based on the KL score, what we get, so based on that. I uh, think by replacement, he means candidates. So I'm having that okay. fourth sentence, and I'm trying the yeah. new one, and the new one, and the new one, so I'm kind of replacing that fourth. But it is really saying, I keep the old summary plus the new candidate all the time. Uh, it's not really replacement as in I'm deleting something from the past. This is a greedy process, so once we decided to add a sentence, the best sentence we have right now, that's it, it stays. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, go. Even the opti may not be the best summary overall in the end. Okay? You guys gonna have a good weekend <laughs> with this uh, homework 5A. Yeah. So let's try to get it done before Thanksgiving and if it's really bad, I don't think it's gonna be that bad because it's a matter of uh, Debugging back and forth is not a, nobody's gonna get stuck conceptually in here. Everybody's gonna be like, why is my array out of bounds? Why am I having all this zero? Why the kill distance produces none values? You know, th that, that's gonna be required debugging. But conceptually, this is a very simple, straightforward pipeline, right? Let's get the next sentence, try it out the best sentence, see what you get. Um, but I would like to have it done before Thanksgiving more or less, if there's a demo remaining to be done over the Thanksgiving weekend or after, I don't mind it, as long as it's kind of built up and it's all a matter of fixing small things. Because after Thanksgiving, we'll be busy. Okay, so if we're good with that, I would like to go back to LDA. I think we're gonna have four lectures, so I, that's the second one, where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build up the theory and the implementation for what we need to actually run LDA ourselves. 
So that's nothing to do with summarization, although we could replace the Python LDA with our LDA and rebuild this thing or redo a lot of other things with it. Clustering, we, we can do maybe classification because in the end, if you look at this matrix here, it gives me a representation of documents on K dimensions. So at the, at the minimum, we can see it as a, as a representation of documents into K equal 50 dimensions if we want to. And again, the difference between this and algebraic methods, PCA methods, DSNE methods, and everything we've seen in the past, it's more semantically me, uh, uh, um, representative of the documents as opposed to linear algebra like PCA or feature selection, pick the best 10 words. This is saying a topic is a concept and if the document is about that concept, it will have a higher weight on that coordinate related to that concept. So where are we? This is a little bit of a disconnect. Um, I don't want to give you, I didn't want to give you the day off today, but in reality, this is the harder thing to do, pedagogically speaking talk about a difficult concept, LDA, at the moment when students are not concerned about it. Everybody's worried about homework four, done almost, I think it's done pretty much, and how the topic summarization and summaries, and how to do that, right? Maybe people have big expectations for parties and traveling over Thanksgiving. So my problem here right now is you guys are not with your minds at LDA and multinomial distributions. And no matter what I do today, uh, it's not, it's not, I mean, I can do an, ex, an exceptionally good lecture, even if then, you know, if people are not connected to it, means I have to do it again at some point. So I'm, I'm fully expecting that we can do some things. The advantage of that is, as, even if I don't have your full attention, I, at least I'm building up something slower, so next time will be easier to delve back in where we are, okay? Um, so let's see, where are we then? The plan in here is to get these things. That's our plan. In the end, we want to do that. For that, we're going to have to do a reverse engineering. So we're going to think in the following way. <laughs> so it's the theory of generative process. And um, the idea is, um, let me do it for coins first. Uh, if I pick a coin, P, uh, P is the probability of head, which is the probability of one. That's the stuff we did last time. And uh, I have N flips or N trials or sequence of length n and out of that I get x heads and n minus x tails that's ones and this is zeros I'm asking what is the probability of that to happen so what is the probability of getting x heads out of n trials with a, we call this a bias for coins because coins are 50 50 unbiased, could be 70 30, right? So if P is 70, I have a coin that's 70 percent chance to give me a, a, a head. So if you look at this sequence here, the sequence is the flip one, flip two, up to flip n, right? And the result is 1, 0, 1, 1, whatever, right? But uh, the probability of getting x, x is the number of heads. It doesn't really matter what's the order in the sequence. It matters how many heads I have. So 1, 0, 1, 1 would be the same as number of heads goes as 1, 1, 1, 0, right? So the probability of that is what? Is the binomial distribution. which is n choose x. We've seen this last time, p of x, 1 minus p at n minus x. This is have to saying is, you have to have exactly x's out of n, in how many ways can you have those x's? 
meaning which positions are the x ones out of n. And this is uh, to get x p is p times p times p times p x times, and then to get the probability of tails is one minus p, one minus p times one minus p times one minus p, how many tails I have. Because those are independent IID flips, every probability is independent of each other. So I need p times to get heads, one minus p, is the tails, I need to get n minus x tails, that's the probability, and then it's in how many ways can I get x once in this sequence out of the whole thing, the combinatorial binom binomial coefficient. Okay? Um. <coughs> in here, suppose I don't know p. But I have a prior probability uh, we call P distributed. It's called the beta distributions, has two parameters, A and B. So when I say P, it's a random variable or a random thing, this tilde sign, it's distributed by this. So if I know it exact, it's not a distribution because I know the value. If not, is a like if it's a Gaussian, it means it has more probability in the middle, less on the sides. If it's a bimodal distribution, it's more on the sides, less in the middle. You know, depending what the distribution is. We have a formula for this. The formula for the beta distribution is not particularly uh, important. But there is a formula here. The only thing I want you to know, because uh, we're not going to make us this, transform this class into statistics now, but you have to know this is a distribution in x. This in here has to do with the probability of getting five heads, six heads, eight heads, how many heads you get. This is a distribution in p. That's the bias of the coin. What's the chance of that coin having the bias 65% heads? What's the chance of P being 50-50? What's the chance of P being 25 to 75? So this is a distribution in P. So if I don't know the coin, I don't know the coin is 70-30 or 60-40. But I have a prior. For example, if I'm a casino, I may assume the prior is 50-50. But I'm not, I'm not saying it's for sure 50-50. I'm saying the most chances are to be 50-50, and there is a lesser chance to be 60-40, and there is a very small chance to be a 99% to one, say, heads versus tails. Although in certain games, players might try to cheat with dice and coins that are not 50-50, right? So again, P is a prior. I don't know the coin. I'm assuming most coins are roughly uniform, 50-50. That's achievable when A is equal B. When A is equal B, the highest probability in the beta function is for 50-50. Now, if A is bigger than B, then it means the heads are more probable. And uh, the absolute values of A and B, even though they're equal, that's a prior of 50-50, the prior strength is given in A and B. The bigger these A and B values are, the more I, I trust the prior. So the way I want you to think of A and B, so I specifically think this is a misleading formula. Like, I, I don't want you to, to think like that. You, I want you to think as A is the number of heads observed in the past. B is the number of tails observed in the past. So as far as the prior, you know, maybe I have not one coin, but six coins, and I have this prior over them. I'm saying, okay, in order to establish a prior, like what do I believe about these coins, these six coins in general, or maybe I have 20 coins. Uh, I look at how many heads I've seen before, a million heads. How many tails I've seen before, 900,000 tails. And I use a beta distribution with a million and 900,000. That would be a very strong prior because these are big numbers. If I only seen 
one head and one tail, I'll use a one and one. That will be a 50-50 prior, but that's a very weak prior because the counts themselves are very small. That corresponds to prior little evidence. So the ratio between A and B tells me whether I believe there is a bias in the coins or not. The absolute values of A and B tells me how strong I believe that. What I show you last time is a posterior distribution, which is prior AB plus evidence. Evidence is x versus n minus x, right? If I pick a coin and I start flipping it n times, I'm going to get a bunch of heads x, and the other ones will be n minus x tails. So now I have two things. I have the prior counts and the actual counts. In other sense, if I have a bunch of coins, like 100 coins, I have a prior over all coins. But when I pick one of them, now I have the prior plus the evidence of that coin, because I'm flipping that coin n times. So often you're going to see this notion of prior evidence. And posterior is, what's the combination of prior with evidence? Now that you have the prior and you flip the coin n equal 10,000 times, we got a bunch of heads, a bunch of tails. What do you think about that P? P is the bias. So did you change your belief? How do we do that? I show you a derivation last time that this posterior, which is the probability of P given the prior, but also the evidence, X and minus X. So again, what are those? A is the number of heads before this trial. B is the number of tail before this trial. X is the number of heads in this trial. And N minus X is the number of tails in this trial. What do I believe now? This is proportional with the beta distribution on uh, A plus X, B plus N minus X. So it's saying if your prior was this beta roughly for the previous counts, now, it's effectively the same function, the same family of distributions, still a beta, that is now intuitively works very nice because it's the previous counts of heads plus the current count of heads. This is the previous counts of tail plus the current count of tails. Now, of course, it needs a derivation. Last time we attempted to do that derivation, uh, which was saying this is a product of probabilities and we plug in this distribution, the binomial, with the prior. We use a little bit of Bayes' theorem in there and the uh, proportionality. And we show last time that the new posterior distribution in the bias of the coin is roughly corresponding still to the beta function, but it's beta combined with the prior. That's why the fact that this beta family of function remains the same beta family of function, so that before the evidence and after the evidence, I have the same form of probability, makes the name conjugate prior. A conjugate prior is the specific prior that remains the same form but changes parameters. Given the evidence distribution. So the evidence distribution is binomial that has to do with the idea that those trials are independent to each other. So that, that this fact comes from the nature of the generative process. If you are to generate n 10,000 things IID, and each one of them has independent probability P, that's called a Bernoulli process. Every flip coin is independent of everybody else, but has the same probability P. Then this is how I describe the generative process of flipping the coins in the air. But the prior, we choose mathematically, is this the correct prior? Is this how coins work? Of course not. But why we choose it? Because mathematically, if you choose this beta function, when you plug in the, the, the evidence in it, you're still in the beta function. So it's called conjugate prior because the evidence preserves the family of distributions on the bias. Conjugate priors are important if you keep having evidence your evidence have to be somehow accumulated in the model. 
right? So you start with some prior, no evidence, then you have an evidence, you see a patient. You have to update that model. You see another patient, you have to update that model. You're a bank, you update a bunch of loans, you, you know, whatever. Well, how you do these updates? You have to keep updating the models. A conjugate prior has the ability of updating those models parameters without changing the structure of the distribution. That's why it's so mathematically golden goose, you know, because we can easily update those priors. You see how easy it is? Just add the count you've got in there. Hands up, who's with me? Now, we, we don't have to understand these formulas. I just wanted to understand the principle of this prior that it starts with something, and when I see evidence, I'm in the same, I, I, I change my belief as far as parameters go, but I keep the same modeling function, the beta distribution for the prior. So that's one of the keys in here. And what happens if my outcomes are not two? When I say uh, coin P, that implies two outcomes, right? Either zero or one. So what happens if I have Z, not Z, T outcomes? Let's call them T1, T2, up to TT. So instead of flipping a coin, I roll a die. So I have six outcomes now. Or I, I pick a word at random from my vocabulary. I may have 29,000 outcomes possible, right? So this is a simple model that works for two outcomes at every flip. But if I am to, say, generate a random word from my vocabulary with probabilities, that's not going to be only two possible outcomes, maybe 29,000. If I roll a die, it's going to be one of the six faces, right? So I, can, I want to repeat this thing where the number of outcomes is not two, but many. So um, probability of this one. Probability. So first of all, who's P? P is not just a probability. This is a simple probability because I only need, uh, if P is 70%, tail is 30%, right? Have to sum to one. But in here, I have a P1 plus P2 plus PT. They have to sum to one, right? This is probability for every one of the outcomes. So if I have this outcome, say I know the I know this at the six, let's say t equals six. That's a die, right? Six faces. And suppose I know the probability p. I know the probability for each exact phase. I do n trials. N equal a thousand trials. Those would be die rolls, right? The outcome of these die rolls it's not gonna be just heads and tails. It's gonna be how many times you see x1, how many times you see the first phase, plus x2, plus x3, plus xn, uh, sorry, plus xt. It's how many times you see phase one, phase two, phase three, and this sum has to be? One. N, because it n trials. These are the number of times you get phase one. This is the number of times we get phase T. So if I roll it 10,000 times, I count how many times I see one through. That's the same exact principle. So I'm not describing something uh, different. It's instead of two faces of the coin, I have six faces of the die. So now what's the probability of X? X is not X is not just the number of heads. It's not just X and the minus S. It's X1, X2, up to XT to see those counts given and the number of trials. I don't have to put n here because n has to be the sum of these guys. n in here means something. I could have say x and n minus x given p. What's the chance of getting that many uh, heads and that many tails in so many total runs? Right. So in here I have how many times I see phase one, phase two up to phase d. Given the p vector, this is the p vector here, the whole thing. Well, that is going to be, it's called multinomial. So there's a, I think you guys have seen the binomial distribution, binomial formula at some point in the past, but I don't know about this one. The multinomial is, it's a n choose x1, x2, xt, 
times the product for t equal 1 to t of it's this thing, it's p t at x t. So it's the same formula saying for each particular phase, multiply the pt for that phase how many times you get it. It's like the same like in here. And this in here, this multinomial coefficient, n choose x, you guys know it's n factorial, x factorial, n minus x factorial. Because that's saying out of 100 trials, how many, how many you get, how, how, how do you get 16 out of them versus 84? and choose x1, x2, up to xt, with the condition that this counts half to sum to n, is n factorial, x1 factorial, x2 factorial, up to xt factorial. So it's exactly the same thing. Instead of splitting n into x and n minus x, I'm splitting n into t things, and then it's n factorial divided by all the factorial products. This is called the binomial. This is called the multinomial. OK? Last piece on this track is what is the don't know p. But I have a prior. I have a belief on what P might be. So a prior means not just I believe it's black or white. I have a probability density function over all possible P's. And if it's uniform, it means I believe the die might be uniform. Just like if A equal B, I believe that's a fair coin. The multi, uh, the this prior, it's called Dirichlet. And is it um, so these are a1, a2 up to a t parameters? It's like just this a and b. I have a bunch of these are previous counts for each phase. So this will be a1 plus a2 plus a t minus 1 factorial. Um, this is the product of a i minus 1 factorial. <coughs> and the product of t equal 1 to t of p i at a i minus 1. So I think it's exactly this guy. Instead of two things, A and B, two counts, heads and tails, I now have six counts. How many times I think I've seen one, two, three, four, up to six. And the distributions you can see, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. A plus B minus 1, it's all the sum minus 1. Everybody minus 1 factorial is the product of this guy's factorials. P at the heads, 1 minus P at the tails, becomes all the P's at the counts, how many I have. Again, the formula is not important, but you have to know two things. One, this is a distribution in P. It's a distribution over the bias. It's not a distribution over the counts. This is saying, what's the chance when you flip the thing a thousand times, roll the door a thousand times, to observe 100 faces 1, 150 faces 2, 220 faces 3, so on and so forth. That's a distribution over the outcome of the die. This is a distribution over the bias of the die. What's the chance to be uniform? That is, all PIs are 1 over 6. Well, you compute this, it gives you a number. That's the chance to be uniform. What's the chance to be, say, assuming these prior constraints, prior counts, what's the chance of the die would have been, for example, 1 half, 1 quarter, and then very small on the faces three, four, five, six. For every piece that you can imagine, probabilities, you can plug the piece in here, and this will tell you what's the chance of that could have been the die with those biases piece, 
if your pri pri previous counts were A1, A2, you know, you look at your past data, everybody who ever rolled a die before, you look at the counts and say, given these counts, here's what I believe what the P distribution of the die might be. So you can see that those are kind of opposite of each other, right? I mean, in, in a very non-rigorous sense, this is saying if you know the bias of the die, what's the chance of, of seeing those outcome when you roll the die? This is saying if you have a bunch of outcomes, what's the chance that your die had the particular distribution of faces? We call that bias, even though bias literally applies more to coins than to dice, right? So when I say bias, I mean what's the implicit distribution of the generative process, the die or the coin? So I can generalize these ideas for the coin into many outcomes simply by uh, updating the formulas from two things into six things or eight things or 29,000 things if I want to. So just to make sure I'm understanding, say I have a uniform die but I don't know it's uniform. I could plug in a bunch of stuff or try to, to maximize that function or whatever and then the this this function So what here, do you have? You have outcomes? I have, I'm trying to figure out what P is. Yeah, and I have outcomes. I have a, I have a history. So that would be, I think let's, let's do it for real. Let's suppose you have previous outcomes, not for that die, but for all the dice manufactured by your company. Okay. And you say, in the past, we notice A1, A2, A2, T, that's across all the dice that we manufacture. That's the counts. Okay. But we, we now pick one die, the new die, that's just being manufactured, and we roll that one. Now, that one may not be exactly the average of all the dice before. Maybe it's a defect in manufacturing and six comes out much more often now, right? So even though we have a previous impression of how those dice work collectively, we want to measure something about this die. So that's a prior. In the past, mm -hmm. dice were, say, roughly uniform if these A counts were roughly the same. Or if, for example, five got manufactured, my, my, make, my machine that manufactures the dice makes some mistakes of phase, phase five, we're gonna see A5 in here smaller than the other ones, right? Because there's a typical mistakes, and we know it happens to most dice, like that, that mistake. But if these are uniform, means I'm manufacturing, in average, correct dice. Okay, now I roll that die, which I don't know the P for, and I observe counts for that die. Mm -hmm. Those are the X's, this is the evidence, right? So that is to say, if you put your hands on a die and you roll it, you get a bunch of outcomes. Now you don't know P, but you have a prior over P. Out of all possible P's, you have a sense of how likely that is in the prior. So now like in here, we wanna combine the prior plus the evidence. We say, okay, on average, my factory manufactures dies with this property, that's my prior but I'm testing that one die, and now I wanna know what is the posterior probability of P given the A array, the previous counts that are not for this die, are for all dies on average, but also the X array, which is for this die. So the same process like in here. I have a belief in what the coin might be initially, that's A and B, but then I roll the coin and I see for that coin heads and tails, so I'm starting to change my belief at some point, right? Because even though my coins are generally uniform or my dice are generally uniform, maybe that one die is messed up. So what will be, I'm gonna skip the derivation. This will be the same Dirichlet function, but it will be distributed A1 plus X1 a2 plus x2 up to at plus xt so effectively says it's the same function this monster here where the counts are the previous counts on average plus the counts observed for that die so if this is a interpretation of how many things i've got for each face of the die how many times i see one two three up to six now i'm saying okay in the past i got that many plus the evidence mm -hmm. that many plus the evidence so you can see in here how the prior strength matters. If A1, A2, so on and so forth are very big counts, 
ain't not gonna change that much when I add few counts, no matter how skewed the X is. Even if X is come six all the time. So X1 is zero, X2 is zero, and X6 is all the die, all the die rolls for that die. If these are in the, you know, hundreds of thousands, and I only rolled die 20 times, it's not going to change my belief that much because there's still going to be hundreds of thousands and I'm just adding 20 to the last count. But if A's are small and X's are big, I'm giving up my prior belief very quickly because it's all going to be mostly X's in there. So it, it, we can plot this formula and look at it, but I want you to really understand it intuitively. It's a reflection of, of how many counts I've seen combined between the prior and this particular die. What are we like getting out of that function though? We're not getting a new vector of p's, yeah. right? This is, no, are? this is the probability on all p's. So oh. this is a distribution for every p. You can plug in the p's in here and you get what's the chance of that p. Okay. So the, in English that is what is the chance that a die with that particular p generated this outcomes x's if the prior belief was the ace. So in complete English, if my factory, manu my factory manufactured dice, and so far all the dice that I've tried have the counts A1, A2, and A3, that's in the past, and I'm picking one die, and I'm rolling it 100 times, and I notice the counts X1 up to XD. Now I'm making a guess on P. P some P, P, any okay. P that's a distribution over six numbers. What's the chance of that P, a die with that P distribution over faces, is the die in my hand that I just used to roll that? The probability is right here. I plug in this formula with the updated count, so it's not just A1, it's with A1 plus X1. That will be the probability of a particular P. It's a distribution because I can plug in any vector P, right? And it will tell me for that vector p, what's the chance to get these observations. And um, how do we understand that there are enough a's now to have like a stable p or? That's a, a separate concern. Okay. This is saying if you believe, if your belief is represented in this a's, let's say prior rolls of all dice manufactured by the same machine, mm -hmm. and the count you have is x. So now, now of course, once you, once you buy into this theory, you can ask, okay, how many rolls do I need to do on this die to be sure that I know what I'm talking about, p values and whatnot, right? So like if evidence is very strong, if you roll dice for a living for like the past 100 years, you know no matter what comes out of this excess in like 100 rolls, not gonna change the distribution. So if you're thinking maybe this is a bad die, you can't apply the distribution for all the past 100 years because this process is just, no matter what comes out, suppose I roll it 20 times, comes out six all the time. This will say nothing changed because the, the previous A counts were so big, they don't matter. But the human will be like, wait a minute, you roll die 20 times and you got sixes all the time? What kind of die is that? Forget about your, your, your prior belief. I don't buy it, there's something wrong with this die, right? So human will react instantly and say, you know, is there a chance that a die can come out 20 times exactly six if it's uniform? Of course it is. One over, you know. People have a skepticism built in and say, give me a break with that probability, right? I don't buy it. I just don't think you can roll a die 20 times and get sixes out of it. But there is a theoretical chance that could happen with a uniform die, right? So I'm not, I'm not gonna philosophically comment too much between math and what people's reaction is, you know? Uh, but <coughs> this is the theory. So we buy this process because we believe the assumption of IID is very close to reality in here. We believe the roll of the dice, especially if they're done by a machine, are independent of each other. So one thing, so let's say we roll the die 20 times, we get sixes every time. So I could plug in like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 as the... 0, 0, 0, 20. This okay. is the count of how many times I've seen each face. Zero. So, but if I'm plugging in P to the Dirichlet distribution, that would tell me that the chance, like with this prior... To get that. The chance to get, like, 
Yeah, to get that is is very low, right? It would be right. like, well, it depends on the ace too. Let's say, but if I had been rolling dice for years, and I, and I am almost oh, sure that then, it's then like, the twenty will still be roughly the biggest chance. The biggest P will still be the uniform one, or very close to uniform. Okay. So the P that there's a lot of P's. We you have to understand the P is a continuous distribution on a simplex of six dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a vector of six numbers, which are real numbers, the sum to one. So for every such p, this will be the density that say, okay, that's the chance of observing that. This is a theoretical model, but the reason we buy it is because we believe the IID this, uh, and the multinomial, it's very close to the reality if the roles are actually independent. So people have shown that flips of coins or die of rolls, most of the time in practice, they're actually independent or close to independent. As opposed to distribution of playing cards, if you play poker or bridge, people have shown that because of how those games go, when you shuffle the cards, you're not getting a uniform distribution. That's why in tournaments they have shuffling machines. It's because when you do it by hand, you're actually relating to the previous game quite, quite severely. But when people roll a die, unless that there is a certain cup to roll the die, that's actually biased. So depending what face you have, you put that face in, and it tells you, okay, most likely it's gonna come out that face when you put it out. But if you roll it in a random fashion way, sometimes people flip the coin, let it cast on the floor, that's well known to be pretty unbiased. So because we believe the ID is close to this notion, also the P is fairly consistent because I'm using the same coin or the same die, so whatever the bias is, it's gonna be the same die. I mean, the, the die bias doesn't change because I roll it or the coin bias doesn't change because I wrote it, right? So we believe P is constant, consistent, the ID is consistent, so this is pretty close to the reality. Now remember we use this function because it doesn't change mathematically. I mean, it changes the structure, but only the parameters. It, it keeps the structure. And it has this nice intuition of the counts being added up, which people find easy to follow. So that's some piece of theory that we're gonna need for the theory side. The other piece, I, I wanna save some time to plug in my laptop at the end. That's useful for you to know, not just for LDA. A multinomial process can happen every time you have IID random trials. I pick a student to do something. And every time I do this, I pick a random student based on the same probability P. So I have a random, I have random probability P, and now I repeat the process, pick a student, do something, put a student back, next day come, do the same thing. That's gonna result in a multinomial. Every time I repeat the process with the fixed probability in an independent setup, I'm gonna get a multinomial distribution. That will happen in many, many instances because many experiments, many processes are effectively based on a fixed distribution and repeat it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. That's gonna result in a multinomial sequence of outcomes. Now, for this particular sequence, we don't care about the exact sequence. Heads, tail, tail, heads. We care about the number of heads and the number of tails. So that's another thing that's needed in order to apply this multinomial thing. We don't care about the sequence. If I do the student's process I described over 100 days, I care about how many times I selected him. That's the count. That not, I don't mean when I selected him, the first, the second, the fourth, so on and so forth, but how many times I selected this process. So multinomial distribution, it's a pretty good representation of that generative process. Repeat a sample based on a fixed distribution, do it n times, and count how many times you got each outcome. The conjugate prior is the Dirichlet function that has a formula uh, this is not the correct formula, but I wanted to do it this way to give you a sense of I can read it because the actual thing is a gamma function and then we'll get stuck at what the heck is that. I don't want to go too far into what the heck is something new. So I'm approximating the gamma function with the factorial, which is actually correct for integers. Gamma of an integer if it's a natural number. So it is the factorial for integers, 
any integers make sense if those are counts, but the general function is gamma, which works for any A, B, C, D, even real numbers. So when you see this, you're gonna be like, why he put the wrong definition? Because I wanna avoid that gamma thing. But for integers, counts, which is actually all we need for LDA. Now in general, these are more than just integers, because I can use beta distributions for A equal 2.5 and B equal 3.7 if I want to. That's why I put the factorials and not the gamma functions that you're gonna see in the notes, okay? Um, <laughs> so that's one piece of a puzzle which is far more useful in general than just LDA. <coughs> so we're gonna have these priors which are my prior belief in say over the documents, how, how a document is distributed over topics I could have that document distribution over topics. That would be having the P. Or I can have a collection of documents that I don't know the P's for each document, but I assume it's coming from a Dirichlet distribution. So that, that, that is gonna happen in LDA. Another piece of the puzzle here, let me move in here, is Um, that's something useful for the homework in itself. I actually, before I do that, let me put up again the generative process that I described last time. Uh, well, so that's what we have here. Let me write it here. Then I move this board up. <coughs> so LDA, it's not LDA, it's the generative process. given docs probabilities and topic probabilities. Uh, for a document D, uh, so generative process results generate a new document. So that's now what we're gonna do this is the generative process that we're going to reverse engineer. Document D is Dirichlet. Document D, uh, let's call it, uh, has generative, this P here, we're going to call it in the notes is theta D. It's a, it's a, it's a distribution over topics. Uh, and it's, I get that di distribution as Dirichlet of some parameters, usually called alpha. So this is saying, uh, when, you, when you get a new document, you have to degenerate the distribution over topics for that document. If it's an old document, you already know the distribution over documents, but if it's a new one, you're just gonna have to choose some distribution over topics. So we choose that from a Dirichlet family, something like this. And then we say uh, for each, each word uh, wi in doc, that i goes to one from the length you want, um, generate zi, this is a membership. Uh, that is the topic um, of the word I. This is generated from a categorical distribution I think that's some called, called discrete. This is the die. Once I have a die, imagine in this process that I already picked the P. 
picking the P is now I have the probability of the die over the six faces, right? P tells me, okay, you choose a die with the following six probabilities. So now that's a discrete distribution of six numbers. The initial Dirichlet how to pick the P is not a discrete distribution. This is a simplex over all possible P's that could be any numbers. But when I pick the P for the die, I now have a distribution of six numbers. What's the probability of phase one, probability of phase two, probability of phase three, up to phase six, right? So imagine I have a machine that manufactures dies that has this uh, posterior Dirichlet distribution of dies. When I call that machine, hey, make one more die, it's gonna choose a P from this distribution, right? But once I have that die in my hand, I'm not in Dirichlet anymore, I have a fixed die which has fixed probabilities over the faces. So now once I choose the document, I have the probability over the topics, which is effectively this line here. I have the document probability over k topics. So now that I have that, I pick that categorical distribution from the this particular distribution here. And now I have the topic. This is telling me which topic it's gonna be, it got selected for that. I choose the word from the discrete of that phi zi. That's fixed. The phi zi is right here. Topics is a fixed distribution over words. So once I know the topic, I'm just gonna go in that topic and say, this topic has a probability over all 29,000 words. Pick a word from that distribution. So easy peasy, right? Given a document, make more of it. This is, we're, we're making more of a document? Yes, so this okay. is a generative process. We're generating a new document. Think of a document as the die. When I say, okay, let's, let's get a generative P for the document, it's manufacturing a new die with my machine. My machine de generates dies with Dirichlet probability functions. Not all dies are exactly the same. Every P is a die. But it's not all dice have the same exact P. The property of a certain P is the stuff in here. So when I call my factory and say, make me a new die, make me a new document, with certain probability, I'm getting a particular P, which is the face probabilities of that die. How much is the probability on phase one, phase two, phase three, up to phase six? Are we good so far? If I call the factory of dice and say, make me a die, it's not gonna produce always the same die. It has a distribution of producing dice. Maybe a lot of dice are close to be uniform, but they're still not identical. But when they give me the die, the die comes in the mail, it's whatever piece that die have. Could be a typical P, close to uniform, or could be a manufacturing error that never produces sixes. That's an extreme case, a die that never rolls a six. So are we good so far? When I say produce a new document, I'm manufacturing a new die. I don't see a lot of smiling faces. That's a I, bad sign in my like, experience. I feel like in this analogy, aren't we making more like die rolls? No, no, no. We're just manufacturing a die first. Die will be the generator of the document. So I'm, I'm okay. saying, I don't want all the documents to have the same generator. There's multiple steps going on here. Yeah. So the first step is getting a generator that is the probability of the faces of the die which in our case is the probabilities over topics. That is this line in here. We're getting this line. How this document's gonna distribute over topics. And so that generator depends on the, the document you have now and the die you I don't got have, the mail. I, I don't have a document. And, okay. I have this maybe probabilities LDA generated or not. I'm saying the initial step of generating a document is to assign probabilities over my topics. So, um getting okay. this right, we, we get the probability vector, and based on the probability vector, we decide the topic, and then... Uh, well, let's not get so far, because I think there's other questions. First of all, I'm getting this line, which is the document probabilities over my topics. If yeah. I have 50 topics, I'm going to have 50 numbers that sum to one. 
just like when I manufacture a die, I'm going to have six numbers that sum to one. So at this point, we are not choosing any of the words, we are just choosing from which row we will be... I'm only guiding the first step is get the generator, which is the, the so probability we, over topics. So we are just selecting that row at this moment, right? Right. W, I, there, we'll just I like want 50 that. numbers that sum to one. Now, it may be from a preset of numbers, maybe I'm only allowing that set. But if it's a Dirichlet family, it's a continuous simplex of distributions. Like my machine will not generate only four possible dice. It will generate everything in that simplex with the Dirichlet probability. So I could get many, many dice, and every P has a certain chance of coming out. P is a die, because it's the probability over the faces. So that's step number one. I got that. Now I'm actually proceeding in generating the document words. So for every word, I know I want 200 words in my document. So I go word one, word two, word three, word three. Those are independent rows. But they not, it's, it, every row is a compound probability. So the first thing is, that's the die roll, get a topic. My, my die here is a probability over topics. So when I roll the die, I'm going to get a topic value. Make sense? Because my initial generation was a probability over topics, just like the die is a probability over faces. So when you roll the die, you get the face, right? Because the die produces faces. My theta D there produces what? Topics. Topics, because it's a probability over the 50 topics. Now, topics are not words. I'm going to get a topic that's ZI, but then. I know it's that topic. There's another step which you say, okay, now the topics are fixed probabilities over words. So you know it's topic Catholic Church. Generate me a word from the Catholic Church topic. That is, this will have high probabilities on things like God and knights and Jerusalem and every the atrocities that they made, okay? And then no probabilities over science and computers because church is anti-science say. I'm, I'm making a joke. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's all War II. I'm going to get something with Hitler, but not related to, okay? So when I roll that die, which is my document, I'm going to get this sequence of outputs of the die. That sequence is going to be topic, 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 topic. It's an ID sequence because I'm rolling the die for every word. But then I have to transform the topic into a word. So I use the probability of the topic into words which is a fixed row here. It says if that's the topic you want for word number 12, okay, well, pick a word from that probability distribution for that word. And then when you move on to the next word, independently pick another topic by rolling the document die. I get another topic. And then I say, okay, what topic did you get? You get that topic, get the word from that topic now. So the only time you're using a document is to pick a, to sample a topic. You're right. Okay. So, are you guys good with that? No. So, uh, the new document that is generated will have the same topic distribution as the one that we are basing it on, right? No. Like, the, well, we go word by word, we select a topic related to that word, and then we generate a new word for it. So, but the topic is still the same. So no, when I move to the next word, I'm generating a topic for the next word. Okay, it's generated okay. from the same die. Okay. So if the die has a high probability on the face 6, okay. it's going to produce topic 6 a lot of times. But even if it does process topic 6 a lot of times, not necessarily the words that come out of topic 6 will be the same. Maybe World War II is a huge face for that document, the die. So it's going to produce World War II almost every time. But then in the World War II topic, there's a bunch of many words that can come out. So even though I get World War II, World War II, World War II, World War II as topics, every time I transform the topic into a, do into a word, I may not get the same word all the time. Now what could happen is I generate another feed, another die, that comes up with different feed distribution over topics. And if that happens, then when I start rolling the die for the topics, I'm getting very different topics than yesterday. So yesterday I generated, I made a die, and that die has a feed and generated certain topics, and then I transform the topics into words. 
But today I'm getting a very different feed that has a very different distribution over topics. So now I'm going to generate very different topics than yesterday. And then those topics would be converted into words. Is it possible to get a word as the same word as a result of different topics? Of course. There might be a word common, I don't know, uh, information might be common between topics that are not so close to each other. So that word may come out as generated by this topic or as by this topic. Now, how do we feel about this? This is a massive simplification which I worked on for like many years to simplify this story in order to make sense the first time. Because when I started teaching this course about 10 years ago, every time I do this story, everybody drops completely. I have no continuation after that. So I, I so hard worked on how can I tell a story that it doesn't kill everyone? I don't know if you feel like we succeeded here with the story. So we have this die analogy. We generate a die. That's a document. That's a distribution of our faces, aka topics. What happens? We then roll the die. How many times? For every word. You have 200 words, you roll the die 200 times. It's going to be topic, 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 topic. Each topic is independently transformed into a word according to the topic probability over words. So there are multiple wrinkles of this story to make it the real thing. One is that none of this stuff is that fixed. So we have probabilities over topics. This distribution is not fixed. That needs to be integrated a mess. Secondly, it's the biggest problem, is we're not actually doing that. Remember? That's the generative process as a model, as a theory. We want to reverse engineer that. We're not trying to generate new documents here. We have the documents and the words. What we're trying to generate LDA find CIs. That is for any document, for any uh, word, what is the the, the proper topic for that word. We also need to find those matrices. So find A. A, A, D is the distribution, I think I call it A, D down, of document D into topics. So K is fixed. K is the number of topics. Fixed in advance by me. And find B, which is the distribution of topics into words. So I mean those two matrices. So reverse engineer means we have the documents and in every document, in every position, we know what word is in there. Because we can look at it and say word number 12 is the word Virgil. What we don't have is A and B and which topic corresponded to which word in which document. Like in document D, position 12. I see the word, but what's the topic that is likely to be sampled to get that word in the generative process? So we need to reverse engineer that process. So you see the word Hitler, and then you need to somehow figure out that that came from the topic, the topic of World War II. But, but you don't know it's World War II, right. and you have to build those topics too. It's like, it'd be easy if somebody gives me the, the, the B matrix, if I have the topics, the properties of a word. It would be very easy to say, okay, what's the chance of that being the topic and not? If somebody would give me the top probabilities of documents into topics, it would also be easy. Mm -hmm. But I don't have either one of those things. I have to create the topics, create the distribution of the topics, and figure out how to sample the topics there. Like this process, sample the topic, I have to control that. Seems impossible. Yeah. So. The way to control that is with something called Gibbs sampling. That the way we're going to do this is to say, how are we going to do this with Gibbs sampling? It's actually called more fancy that I collapse Gibbs, but what we want is to pick a topic, sample ZI. Um, actually, we're going to do it here in the reverse one. So sample 
zi proportional to the probability of z given the rest. We're going to call this the Gibbs process. And then update everything. based on this ZI sample. So we, we only need to sample this in the reverse. Once we, up, once we, assuming we have everything else in place, this is a conditional that moves back and forth. So we need the conditional of that distribution for that word. So the word appears here, the document, and all other topics. So iteratively, we're going to say, keep everything you have in place. Just resample one topic for one document for one word. Whatever topic you get from the conditional distribution is going to cause an update for matrices A and B. You got to trust me on that until next time. Now, of course, I'm not going to finish in time. You guys know that. <laughs> uh, but I want to connect my laptop to leave you with, with a, a, a not, not with a disaster thought in mind, but with a, with a actually uh, a good sensation, you know, with a good feeling. This sounds like uh, somebody said impossible. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's see. So if I go to a homomorphic B, it will rightly sound impossible the way we describe it, but actually very simple. If if somebody that was me took the time to transform all this theory into an actually okay, what do we need to do here? So a lot of this stuff is preps. A is the matrix of the document distributions. Initially, it's just the alpha. That's a prior, Dirichlet prior. So I'm setting that alpha, I think, uh, uh, one or two or something. And then I, I red map me some matrix of lines all made of alphas. So, so it's just an initial thing. And then B is the, so A, I initialize this A with the prior. B, I initialize the B with the prior. So you can see the priors are, are uh, very simple, you know, five, 1K means uh, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. And 1W means uh, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, right? Because it's two times in there. So it's this 2, 2, 2, that's 5, 5, 5. The actual strength of the prior is minus 1 because of this is minus 1 in there. So the actual strength is 1 and 4. Z is my matrix <coughs> of, of topics that have been sampled. So this Z has to be for... Um, uh, each document, how many, for each word in the document, what's the topic being sampled. I make those matrices. B is just a summation to help me out. Uh, uh, B sum is a summation of Bs. So what happens here? For each iteration, for each document, for each word in the document, so I'm going over the reverse here. The only thing that needs to be done is to figure out this Gibbs distribution. So I put here the final derivation from a paper that we have to go on next time. But as a minimum, here's how simple it is to obtain that distribution. This is the only line that you need, assuming you understand the model notation. This dot something, it's operant by cell. So it's cell by cell when it says cell multiply, you take every cell from here, multiply with that cell from here. It's not a matrix multiplication, it's cell by cell. And dot divide, it's also cell by cell, so this is a parenthesis transpose, so that corresponds to this thing right here. It tells me that the distribution over ZI, that's what I have there, the conditional topic over everything else, is proportional with this. So I'm looking at this, this is my A matrix right here, 
Because remember what's going to happen in A? I'm going to add the counts I started with plus with the counts I observed. So that's going to be right here. This is the original count plus the counts observed. And this is going to be the B matrix that's for the topics into words probabilities. That's going to be the initial counts plus the counts observed. And this in here is the divided by B sum. We're going to do this derivation next time. So we only need that. Once we have that piece of cake, we sample from a categorical distribution. So when I say sample, this pro once I figure out this probability, is a probability over, over uh, words, right? So I sample, uh, sorry, over topics. So I sample a topic from that distribution. How do I do that? MATLAB has a function for it. But I think we discussed last time we can do a binary search into the cumulative distribution if we don't have such a function. This distribution is not uniform. So when I sample from a non-uniform distribution over k 50 things. So imagine I give you a probability, 50 probabilities. I say, get one of the items according to those probabilities. You can apply a function built in, or you can generate a number between 0 and 1 and figure out binary search between the CDF where you actually get that number to get the value, right? We'll discuss this also next time. I'm getting that. This will be my topic for that word in that document. It's an ID. All I have to do is update the IDs. So plus one, update the counts, plus one. This has been decreased initially. So I'm updating here. This is just plotting. This doesn't, it's not part of the algorithm. So the whole reverse LDA comes down to the only difficult part is computing that conditional distribution. Everything else, piece of cake. So what would I do if I run this thing? I don't have time to run it here, but um, uh, the usual typical uh, plotting is, since we don't have an evaluation metric, this is six topics. And what we do here, is plotting for each topic, we're plotting this. So for each topic, I plot the words. Bigger words correspond to bigger probabilities. So you can see this, this corresponds to these words, the higher ones being that there's a function that does this in Python and MATLAB. And uh, it's up to us humans to say, okay, does this topic make sense? Meaning they, they're consistently with something. Now, these are documents that I, they might be, I, I don't know where I got them from, sonnets or something like this. But I think if we run 20 news groups or maybe Wikipedia, we get more consistent topics. It also matter of how many topics we choose in there. So the typical way to look at this is to say, uh, plot the topics and see if they make intuitive sense. That is to say, I have six topics. Are they you know, commonly representing something in there? So this is done by my code, and there is another code that's from a package that will, will do, do it maybe better than this. Okay, so what I wanna, again, show you here is that even though the theory is very heavy, um, the actual coming down to, simply to, to the implementation is not that bad. Uh, this is what I've got. That's a different data set. So I think that's the 20 news groups here. So you can see in 20 news groups, I think it worked better. This, is, this, this looks like a lot of stuff related to computers hardware. And uh, this stuff looks like, you know, University NASA space research. I mean, it makes something intuitively make sense. So we're going to ask you to create those plots like this. Now, part of that homework includes other sampling. So next time we have to talk about how do we actually sample. That is not how to produce the distribution. Once you have the distribution, how do you get an item from that distribution? Because you know, with the die, you can just roll the die to see what face you get. But we, we don't have dice, right? We have to actually simulate the thing. So I'll show you a few techniques, four techniques, for how to sample with a computer algorithm from a non-uniform distribution, from Gibbs sampling, from whatnot, uh, that is, you know, if you want to sample from a given distribution, how do you do it? All right. 
So next time we're going to do sampling and I think we're going to need one more lecture to deal with LDA. That will be after Thanksgiving. <coughs> In the meantime, so of course, you guys are going to work on 5.8, right? In the meantime, we're going to do the summarization. And if you use LDA, it will be an LDA that's from a library. Um, it would be all right if I listed you as a reference for a job offer I just got. I think all you have to do is fill out like a bubble form. That's okay. Uh, I, I don't say no to this, but uh, the only thing I can say is like we don't have any projects or anything. Yeah. Classification. I, I don't think anybody cares what you said. Oh no? I, I, you already I mean, got the job. I got the job. So, so why you so need the reference then? They want to have it in their back pocket okay. to use against me. <laughs> We should have to.